Hi, everyone. My name is Melody Frierson, and I am the project manager with the Office of the CEO and President and Chief Transformation Officer at New America. I am so excited to welcome you to, to today's event to discuss Anne Marie Slaughter's renewal from crisis to transformation in our lives, work, and politics. This event is presented in partnership with our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. Please support them. Anne Marie is the CEO of New America and author of eight books, including Renewal. Renewal is Anne Marie's candid and deeply personal account of how her own odyssey opened the door to an important new understanding of how we as individuals, organizations, and nations can move backward and forward at the same time facing the past and embracing the, a new future. The moderator of today's conversation is Kiese Lehman. Kiese is the inaugural McAlexander Chair of English at the University of Mississippi, my alma mater, an award-winning <laughs> author of bestsellers like Long Division, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, and Heavy, an American memoir. I am really excited to have Kiese in conversation with Anne Marie. And I just have to do a plug. I don't have Anne Marie's copy in front of me, but I have a couple of PSA's books. Please, please go buy them. They are um, so wonderful. And PSA reading you is like uh, going home and, and being at home. Um, so thank you for all that you do. And I want to thank everyone who has joined us today. Um, and we, I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to thank Melody for uh, being so incredible and also being one of the reasons that I came back to Mississippi. Um, uh, I found a lot of hope and faithfulness and actually like possibility for renewal in our conversation. <laughs> so, Anne Marie, I am really, really, really excited. You know, I, I talked to a lot of people about their books. Uh, and I've, been talking to a lot more people about their books over the pandemic but this is the first time I really believe that the author like wants to kind of get in there get messy and let's see what can happen so but but I want to make sure that that's true so can we make this a sort of rigorous conversation as, as rigorous as we can get for 40 minutes a hundred percent yeah if, you if I can't no if I can't handle it I shouldn't have written the book Okay. All right. All right. Um, I, I, I just have ideas that I want to ask myself. Um, and so some of those ideas I want, I want to push you on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of things that you do in this book that I'm still sort of astounded by. So I want to jump to the first chapter. When you invite us as readers into a crisis that you experienced as the leader, my first question was, were there people who told you, I think you're revealing a little too much about the insides of how New America works when you wrote that initial chapter? Yes. Uh, and in fact, so this is a crisis, you know, it's four years old. I wouldn't have written this book, uh, you know, in, in 2018 or probably 2019, it's 2021. Uh, and we've, we've come through it long since. Uh, I was very careful to both show our board chair and our, you know, our, our communications team and, and at least key parts to my leadership team, because obviously the last thing I'd want to do uh, is to, to drag things up and, and or hurt, hurt new America. So I got approval. Um, the other thing is, though, that, you know, the point of the book is, OK, this was my crisis. It is not the worst crisis anybody's ever been through, and I'm very clear about that. I'm basically saying all of us have had some kind of crisis, and I do think that my own experience can be instructive. It was bad enough for me to really shake my confidence, my sense of who I was, uh, and that that's sort of the trigger. But uh, I was, yes, I, I was careful. You know, there are folks who said you just shouldn't reveal that much about yourself. You know, obviously mm -hmm. people who are close to me. Um, but I, I, I think I couldn't write this book without bringing readers into where where I started and my own journey. Yeah, I mean, and one of the things that you do also is, you know, you you, you ask us to risk, 
right? I mean, I feel like this book, and, and, and I think the us, the subject positions of us are something you pay a lot of attention to, but every single subject position in this book must risk. I'm interested in how you thought about the consequences of risk for different people in different social strata, right? Because one of the things you also write about is this common past. I want to I want to get in there and mix that up a little bit. But before we can get there, I want to I want to hear you talk about the ways that like your risk in telling that story might differ from somebody else's risk who is in a different subject position, yet how you still believe and know that risk is something that we must do if we are to renew. Uh, that's a that's a great way of framing that question. So in the first chapter I say you know, we had this crisis. I went and talked to a board member. He told me run toward the criticism. You know, and he, and he, he actually said, I didn't put this in the book, but he said, you know, imagine you're having a, a fight or a conversation with your spouse or partner, and you're confident that your spouse or partner is 98% wrong, but mm. maybe 2% right. He says, mm. run toward that 2%. And that sort of launched me on a, on a quest to ask a lot of people, but what I was doing well, but more importantly, what I wasn't doing well. And I then say, and this will go directly to your question, I decided it was critical for me to look in the mirror and to see not only what I wanted to see, but what other people see. And then of mm -hmm. course I say that the country should do the same thing. Now that is, I would not, I, I would give that advice to other white people of privilege, right? Um, because I also, and not all, because I spend a lot of time mentoring younger women, for instance, and what other people see is cover, colored by bias. And if they're young women of color, then that's, that's doubled or tripled. Uh, and so I'm not actually telling everyone to look in the mirror and see what others see and take it, you know, as given. And even some of the criticism I got, I said, no, you know, you wouldn't have said that if I'd been a man or you, right. no, absolutely not. But what I am saying, and I do think this is right, is that all of us are defensive about something. You know, mm. Van Jones always says, all of us have a blind spot and a sore spot. Mm. <laughs> and we, and it, I think you have to find the courage to explore that. Uh, you know, I, that's sort of standard therapy jargon. If you can't name it, you can't change it. But mm -hmm. I wanted to show what it's like to take that risk. Again, you need to keep your confidence. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd frame that differently for different people. But I think an awful lot of people in this country need that advice. And when I'm talking about the country looking in the mirror, yeah, again, I'm, I'm certainly talking to white people more than people of color, although they're communities of color, you know, Hispanic communities who have their own, uh, mm -hmm. you know, biases and prejudice against darker skinned people. So, it, you know, very few people are really completely immune. But mostly I'm saying to folks like me, you know, we got to look in the mirror and we got to look in the mirror as a country and see a very different reflection. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. You, you write um, early in the book. My larger goal is to encourage us all to reflect more on what individual experience can teach us about the path to collective renewal. Like I'm, I'm a, a writer who's just really big into sort of bombastically letting folks know early on what they're getting into. And I think you do that um, in this book a few times early on, but I really want us to kind of untangle this idea of individual experience teaching us about collective renewal how can you how do you and i think you've done this in the book but for those folks who have not read the book how do you prove to us let's just call us possibly cynics that there <laughs> ever has been something that could be renewed like for those of us who who, who, who find very little um kindness, perpetual organization, perpetual care, reciprocity in this American experience. How do you talk to that person and say, we need to renew when that argument is like, no, we might need to actually raise, right? Right, like raise, like yeah. tear it up. 
Why like renewal? R A Z E, right? Yes. Not right. R A I S E. <laughs> right. Yeah. So talk to me about renewal as opposed to raising. Yeah. And I think that's one of the hard parts of the book. Um, and I'll just say I'm married to one of those cynics. So <laughs> not, <laughs> not that he he has not had a terrible hand dealt him, but he he's, you know, I'm definitely the kind of person who keeps the hope uh, alive in the family. Um, mm -hmm. So I write about this also that in early when early on in new at New America when I when I joined New America we already had renew as part of our mission statement and I kind of sharpened that and would talk about renewing America and then I and I would talk about it like a renovation you know I'd say mm -hmm. you know you go into a house and you tear down a lot of stuff you do raise stuff you know if you got asbestos you wipe that out you mm -hmm. you look at things that people thought were beautiful 100 years ago and you think it's awful and you get rid of that and then you renew the parts that are good even that i think is not enough mm -hmm if we're really gonna look at the country. I've settled and, and I was educated, I, I'm not gonna lie. I, mean, I really had to hear people saying just what you said, you know, like I, I, there's not parts of America I wanna renew, but we settled on renewing the promise of America. And mm. there I basically looked to Martin Luther King, you know, that idea that the Declaration of Independence is a promissory note. And it was, right? We're, we're announcing that we believe we, now here we as white men of property, you know, in, in, in 13 col colonies, but actually in the Declaration, it's fewer than that, mm -hmm. saying, you know, all men are created equal. Well, they meant all white men of property, but we there is a promise there, I think, in part because they didn't say all Americans, they said all men, mm -hmm. of, of what it could be if you really were created equal, if you really lived in an equal society. So I now think of it as renewing the best of yourself, if you're thinking about it individually, if you're an organization or a country, renewing your commitment to principles that you mm -hmm. espouse, but that you always fall short of. Again, I can understand why for some people that's not enough, I say it's between restoration and revolution. We don't want to make America great again. Mm. Uh, it wasn't great for a lot of people, but I, for one, I'm worried about revolution. I'm not at all sure who, who's mm. gonna win. I don't wanna go there. Mm. Um, and I will say also, this, this is a book designed to speak to multiple audiences. And right. I know that if I'm speaking to the white people I grew up with, they're gonna have to find something to hold on to. And that's very deliberate. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I really liked how early on in the book, you, you're, you're very specific about the audiences that you want to speak um, to um, and, and, and for. And I think that that setup prepares us for the big ideas, right? Like you, you talk, you actually call them big ideas and you talk about big ideas. But I think in order for big ideas to actually be, you know, to saturate us, sometimes we need to hear from authors like where they situate us as audience. So I really appreciate how you did that. I want to go back to this idea, though, of a common past, which is tied mm -hmm. to this, if we're going to make a schism, a schism between folks who might say renewal and folks who might say um, raise, or, you know, folks who might consider themselves, uh, you know, glowingly right, folks who might consider themselves neon left. <laughs> Why is it so hard for us, and I think it is hard, to accept a common past and does your idea of renewal necessitate that we accept the common past? So, you know, at the end of the book, I say, I would like to see in 2026 that we change the national motto from e pluribus unum, out of many one, yes. to pluris et unum, many and one. And I'll just say I had to have my Latin corrected because in the early draft, <laughs> I said pluribus et unum and somebody wrote back and said pluribus is you know, not the right. But, and that is how I now think of it. I don't think there's one common past. Indeed, mm. what I am saying, I mean, I you know, above your head is the word is past, you know, by Clint Smith. And he was a, a New America fellow when he wrote it. And that is a book that is retelling the story of Monticello that I grew up with, right? As Monticello mm -hmm. Plantation. And it's going through place after place. And I could give you a narrative of most of those places that I grew up with, 
the past he's telling is not my family's past, except mm. probably, I, I mean, I come from the South. I'm, there were certainly people in my past who enslaved, uh, who enslaved others, enslaved African-Americans. So, but that's not a common past. Right. But I do think, I do think we can be many and one at the same time. And, and for many people, that's frightening. I think for many others, it can be, it's not a rainbow coalition. That's that's just too sweet for me. But it's it's that multiplicity of stories that if you can hear them mm. and sit with them, mm. and I've had to learn this. This has not been easy for me initially. Then you can start to appreciate the richness of the country in a way that I still think you can say is we are one. I don't think you can say we are the same. That's the point, that you have to be able to be different and the same at the same time. Right. I love that answer. Um, so, you know, reading the book, I kept thinking about uh, growing up, I'm sure before it is, but I remember in my early teens, it was the first time I started to remember mo a lot of older men started to use this sentence, I don't regret anything because if I did, do something different, I wouldn't be the person I am today. You know, when I when I was 13 or 14, the first time I remember, I remember thinking, man, that's faulty logic. Because it would be, I would hear it from people who had every reason in the world to want to be different today than they were yesterday. But but that sentence, right? Something we we've heard from Trump, something we've heard from lots of powerful particular men, right? I don't regret much because those mistakes made me. When I hear that now, I hear a particular person who does not have the stomach to remember. Yet your book is calling on us to, to, to have the stomach, the gall, the will, the skill to remember, to actively regret, and to do different. How do we get to the do different if we collectively right now don't even have the will to individually remember when we've done harm to ourselves or other people? So I think part of the answer is to redefine what strength and courage are. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly why I try to be as unsparing as I can be mm -hmm. on myself by, by saying, look, it is much harder to face yourself, your past with what I call radical honesty. Right. And it is to deny it all. And, and I think it's not accidental that you say men, right? I think this is, this is written into masculinity and you've written about this, right? right. There, there are codes of masculinity there. And I've written a lot about, you know, about gender that say, you know, never explain, never complain, never examine. And, I, you know, interestingly, I thought a lot of men would really just not even want to open this book. And there probably are mm. a lot of them like that. But I've heard from a number of male leaders already mm. saying, you know, you kind of gave me permission. Right. <laughs> and, right. and what I want to do, I'd say it to my sons, I'd say it to a lot of those men you're talking to, you know, if you're really the man you think you are, mm. then you've got to have the guts <laughs> to do that. And I want to say that to the country too. That's again, right. a, a way of saying, you know, I'm not anti-American. There's a whole part of there that really talks about patriotism and love yeah. of country. But I don't think you can do that honestly unless okay. you are willing to say, you know, I'm going to look at the past and I was wrong. Right, right, right. And, 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 and I think from a leadership sort of position, there's, there's one way to talk and write about it. But I think, I think what actually makes it harder for me is that, you know, we often want lead. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself in a collective we that I don't necessarily feel a part of. But for this conversation, I think we off we often want leaders who don't do that, right? Like because strength, as you say, is somehow equated with not looking backwards. Yeah, like you know what I mean. Like I'm, I'm, I'm and 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 what I love about your book is like if if anything, it is a tutorial on the importance of every single individual looking back, every single individual looking back at the ways that they've harmed somebody yeah. directly, indirectly. And by harming that some person, I think what your book really is, is arguing, subtextually at least, 
is that you are harming yourself. I don't care if you're a multi-gazillion millionaire. Like you, Donald Trump has done so much harm to Donald Trump in the last eight years, four years. Well, you know, 70 something years as well, <laughs> right? But I want to get to this idea, though, that it was really percolating in the text and also that I saw in the text as like an, an art object, right? Like this to me feels like um, a narrative experiment. Like it, it seems uh, risky to write this book. It seems like, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know. But it seems like, a, I mean, like there's a part of me that would be like, we need leaders in this, in this nation to write books like this. And I would just say it and never expect it to be done. So you've done something that I've not seen done before. It in and of itself is an experiment. If the experiment fails, there will be consequences, but you will be okay. I'm interested in how you see renewal and experimentation sort of relating when we think about the groups, the millions of people, and particularly like younger people in our country who are not given the, the leeway to experiment. And not only is that experimentation like sort of disciplined, often it is incarcerated. So like, how do we deal with experimentation? which this book is really calling for when we see carcerality sort of hitting us in the head, some of us from the time we're one to the time we die and telling us do not experiment in this particular way. How do we do yeah. that part of what yeah. you're calling for? Uh, so, there, so I think there are a couple possible answers. And one, you're absolutely right. The book's an experiment. I've never written anything like it. It was by far the hardest thing I've ever had tried to write and wrote, it's also an experiment in form, right? It doesn't yeah. have subheads. There are no subheads. It's it's really, I tried to write it more like my favorite novels that kind right. of weave together different pieces and you can kind of weave them together differently. Uh, and that, so that was an experiment uh, as well. One point on leaders, I do think we're in a time that leaders who just are rigid and I'm right and I'm not going to show any weakness that you're going to, you know, it's like the, the, the whole thing about the, the reed bending before the wind rather than mm. the, you know, the wall mm -hmm. getting knocked down. It, things are coming at you so fast. Nobody can actually know what to do. You, you need a lot of people and you need to be able to say, whoop, I thought of this, but I thought this was true, but it isn't. And now I'm going to revise. Right. And so partly, I think the times we're in are more conducive to a kind of leadership that is flexible and adaptable. And to do that, again, you just have to, to, to be willing to say, no, I thought this, I was wrong. I, I say somewhere that there are days at New America where I measure how right I am by how often I change my mind, right? Because right. I was really listening right. hard and, yes. and, and kind of adding evidence. But the point that you're making, this goes back to the, my discussion of risk. Risk mm. is, is a marker of privilege. Right. Mm. So I talk about, you know, the risks I've taken and I, you know, I went to law school. And I thought I was going to go to a big law firm and I dropped out. I didn't drop out. I became a, a research assistant to a law professor. But there are about four years there where I didn't really know what I was going to do. And by, you know, by my fellow students and my peers, I was taking a risk. But in the larger th scheme of things, I could always go home to my parents and I had, mm. you know, fancy degrees. I, wa mm. I was going to be fine. Mm. And, and I talk, I cite a lot of research that shows if you really want people to be able to experiment, to either, you know, start a company or invent something new or get a degree that's very different than, you know, the path their parents wanted them to be on, they cannot be in a situation where one false step lands them in prison right. or where, you know, if they take a risk and lose some money, they're going to lose their house. Yeah. People yeah. will not take risks in that setting. And right. if, if the United we the United States has a whole narrative of being risk takers and entrepreneurs, we actually are going to have to provide not just a safety net but a whole foundation for people if we mm -hmm. want more people to be able to take those risks. So right. I would not tell somebody who is facing you know who knows that that you know incarceration is two steps away. No, in those settings, and a lot of parents in those settings say stick to the rules don't make waves, 
I think we're losing a lot of talent that way, but I wouldn't expect somebody who's got that much to lose to take the kind of risks that I can or, or my kids can. Yeah. And, and I love that you, you say it so bluntly, right? Like we are losing a lot of talent that way. Um, and, and so, and, and then it seems counterintuitive for the way I imagine leaders, because when I imagine a leadership, I do imagine some sort of like, you know, cardboard, cut out of morality. Um, but I know that there's a lot million kinds of leadership, but my my understanding of leadership is often very narrow. But but what what incentivizes leaders who often did not have to fairly compete to like broaden the talent pool that could one day subsume them? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, absolutely. Uh, well, a lot don't, right? I mean, it is right. clear right. that a lot of people are willing to, you know, talk the talk of diversity and, you know, shared power at, until it comes down to actually moving over or stepping down. And I talk about sharing power and, I'll, you know, for me, no, have I stepped down to hand off my, my job uh, to somebody else who, who has not had nearly as many advantages as I have? I haven't. I've split my job, though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that a lot of people could do. And in splitting my job, I've created so I'm CEO and there's a pre an opportunity for a president. Uh, and that then creates space that just didn't exist. Right. So for me to talk about the payoff, the payoff is partly from a just in general. And maybe it's also because I'm older. There is so much talent. And I just right. it kills me that we. Are, are not tapping it, you know, as, as an American, we have just extraordinary opportunities. But the other thing is leadership is so much more fun this way. Mm. You know, I also had this image that, you know, I had to know what, what to do. And again, I've got to make decisions that are tough decisions. And if, if there's really, you know, people can't agree, you know, the buck does have to stop somewhere. So there is that dimension of leadership, but leading with other people, and really sharing the problems of your organization or whatever it is you're leading is, is just much more fun. And I'm also much more confident that, that at least for this moment in history, we're leading better because I'm confident mm. that I have to hear different voices. This is not just, oh yeah, different life experiences feed in right. differently. This is, we're in a time of change. I've got a lot of young people who want things that are very different than when I was coming up and I need I need other voices. I love that. Um, I just wanna make a reminder for um, the audience to please uh, submit your questions via Slido, which is the box located to the right of the video. Uh, we're gonna make time for hopefully all the questions, but definitely as many questions as possible. So again, just the box located right to the right of your video. So fun is not a word that I thought I would hear, but 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 it's a word that I that I wanna I wanna sort of explore a bit more, right? Because again, like when one the way you wrote the book, I think invites not just different readerly sensibilities, but also different sort of narrative threads. So the one of the threads that I saw was the thread of pleasure and joy, mm -hmm. right? And and so I'm interested in what fun pleasure and joy have to do with something that, that feels so soulfully like achy as renewal. <laughs> and I've never heard leaders talk about joy, pleasure in relationship to renewal, but I wonder if we could just do that for a bit. Yeah. Um, well, of course, one thing is if you've, if you, if you've known darkness, light is that much brighter, right? Mm. And I, you know, mm. I say like this time of year, as the light fades, I always, I often have a hard time. Um, and certainly, yeah, that first chapter, first couple of chapters, it was heavy. I mean, right. <laughs> that's the name of one heavy. of your books, but, it um, and it, it, but, you know, I also write about resilience and resilience being, I say resilience is a team sport, which is something else I had to learn. I thought of resilience as kind of like making like a rock and hunkering down and just right. letting things kind of wash over you. And I discovered instead, it's, it's much, you know, forging relationships, going through an experience with other people um, made a, made a big difference. Uh, and, 
you know, then as I started to kind of learn, and I, I, I also think a lot about attaching a larger meaning and purpose to our mm -hmm. lives, that that is, mm -hmm. a, that is something human beings seek. And for me, anyway, the sense of growing and learning is a deep source of pleasure, of, of joy. You know, I, I, I've changed a lot of jobs often because I love to just kind of keep challenging myself uh, and learning. And I learned a lot through this yeah. process. And, yeah. it, you know, and I read a lot and a lot of what I read was wonderful. And I also, you know, it's partly during the, well, it was the, only the end of it was the pandemic, but, you know, I write about about birding, about grace, about you know books that I love and that, that are sort of my friends, and and I would say, and again, this is something I really think I learned. It certainly wasn't true when I was dean at the School of Public and International Affairs. I love my colleagues. I really mm. genuinely feel privileged to be able to, you know, to work with them on on work that I th I think has meaning. So I don't see why leadership. It's not, not going to be fun all the time. That's impossible. Right. And raising money is really hard, but yeah. there's lots of parts of it that are fun. And, and, and this idea of, of work as a site of potential transformation. Hmm. But, but first, I think you're arguing that work can also be um, a site of sort of like of, of, of fluidity I'm interested in what happens to the worker who loves to read this book at home, loves to talk about these ideas possibly with someone they love, but feel completely and utterly terrified to bring much more of who they are as a human to a space that has historically punished them and people who look like them for being human. So 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 I'm interested in like how we deal with that part of what you're of what you're calling for when when like when I wrote heavy for example everybody in my family was like do not put that shit out in the world why <laughs> because because because, because a lot of people were like you haven't put it out in the world and people have, have have pummeled you anyway we don't need people looking into our families and obviously I push back but but how do you make the argument that not only should we push back but their sites their sites of labor that should be places where people open themselves up much more. I'm just speaking yep. particularly about people who have already been made vulnerable by workplaces. Yep, exactly. Yes, and I will say, I should have said that to begin with, when I read Heavy, I, I and I did, at the end of it, I thought, wow, you know, if, <laughs> if you can do it and you are, you are, it, you know, it's a heavy book, right? Exactly. There's a lot of really tough stuff in there. And I was so impressed. And I said, I read Darnell Moore's No Ashes in oh, the Fire, right? At the same time, very similar kind of, it's a fabulous book, but he really lays it out. And in the same way, he's talking about family, he's talking about being challenged personally. Um, but so again, I do, I, you know, I, I write at the beginning, if I've learned anything over the past decade, it is to be very conscious of the we, you know, as you say, mm -hmm. that positionality. And so I imagine New America employees reading this book, and I imagine some number of them are going to say, yeah, she talks the talk, but we got a long way to go, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no question that um, we're in a transformation, but it's, it's hard and slow. I think that there is a different responsibility for those of us who have power and privilege. I write mm -hmm. about, I've always talked about leading from the center and I've always said, you know, instead of being at the top of a hierarchy, I think of myself as the center of a web, but I wasn't thinking nearly enough about the folks on the margin of that web. The, mm -hmm. the folks who really feel, as you said, that the entire workplace is not designed for them. I mm -hmm. can access that because the workplace was designed for men, not women. And I've right. certainly experienced that plenty. But again, it's taken me a lot to realize just how hard it is for somebody who has been historically disadvantaged, who's, who's gotten to where they've gotten by fitting themselves into somebody else's box yes. and who, you know, who am I to then say, yeah, and it's up to you to go and tell the boss what she's doing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where allies come in, but I also think it's up to me as the boss to try to create the spaces where, where people are, are, feel more safe. 
And this is another reason why it's so critical to have folks who are, you know, women, folks of color who in power positions, because they're going to hear stuff that I'm never going to hear. Right? right. And they can tell me because they've got, they've got more, more power. But I think, yeah, you know, this is, we don't need to put more on those who have had not nearly enough to begin with, but we we should be telling folks who have more power, um, this is your job. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, and and the we, yeah, we should be telling folks if this is your job. I I want to I want to make sure I get this question in because uh, we need to be jumping to the uh, questions from the audience pretty soon, but. Because so much of this book is about risk, is about experimentation, um, and and I think you know I'm just someone who believes anytime you write a book, you should attempt to obliterate the genre that people think the book is in. And I feel like you've done that. I feel like you completely did that. And 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 if if anybody like thought for a second that you didn't, like when you when you jump us to 2026, and, like, and you know, and we are there, right? Like. I love that move. And I'm interested in if there was any fear in, in just making that move in a book, because this is a move that we've rarely, if ever, seen an American leader make in a, in, in, in a book. Like, were you afraid to jump there? That's interesting. Um, that part, I was not afraid, although, so first of all, the highest compliment you could possibly give me is to tell me that I managed to break a genre, because I was very oh, consciously no. trying yeah. to, to do something different, uh, and and I feel good about that, you know, and, and I, again, I devour tons of fiction and tons of narrative nonfiction trying to, and a lot of it's pushing these boundaries. Um, the 20, the coda says, yes, it's 2026 and here's what's happening. And one of my friends who read it said, I really thought that was right. I thought there was, this was, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, so part of it is, um, that's an agenda that I'm laying out. That is also a challenge to me and to new America and to a lot of the people I work with. Um, but I also say, you know, what's your vision of 2026? 2026 right. is the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. As I start out, I say, you know, in 1976, when I was 18, manning a bicentennial booth at the University of Virginia, it was like Jefferson Central. Wow. It was triumphalist. You know, it was the great United States in 1776, and we conquered the frontier, and we, you know, no self-examination. This time is going to be very different. And so I thought, and, and I, I was, you know, the, the coda is called the America that has never been yet, yet must be. And that's from Langston Hughes' poem, uh, Oh, Let America Be America Again. And I thought, you know, if he can have mm. the courage to imagine this America that has never been yet, but he says, yet must be, you know, yeah. that's, a, that's a statement of faith. And, right. and, if, and if somebody, you know, somebody on the right would say that is deeply patriotic. That's how I read it. So for me, it was, I thought, you know, I'm just going to lay it out there, but I'm not going to pretend that's everybody's vision. And a lot of people would might find that a nightmare, but I am going right. to ask readers to, to fill in their vision, because I think, I do think this country needs that. We are so so mired in division and polarization and hate and, and sadness and death. And because that's all happening, but I don't think you can change with, and again, going back to the personal, I have to have a vision of who I can be before right. I can even try, even though I know I'll never get there. Right, right. And, and I'm sure you've talked to people about this vision and, and, and I'm sure you've looked in people's eyes and saw vacancy. Every, so at some point, right? So, yeah, or else they think I'm just crazy. Right, right, right. I like that. I like that a lot better than the. the it's just um, like okay, what's right. this woman on? But so, but so, so, how do you deal with people who you know have the power to make substantial change in millions or hundreds or thousands of people's lives, looking at you? either vacantly or like you're out of your mind? Like, how do you deal with anger? Is one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask oh, that's when I finished this book. Anger at, 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 your, at your fellow leaders. Do you know what I mean? Like not just yeah. anger, like at home 
though I think anger at home is anger at fellow leader, but like, how do you deal with looking in the eyes of folks who you know could and should possibly look backwards and revise publicly? How do you, how do you deal with people saying, no, that's not how I want to lead? Yeah. Um, so part of it is I say, I d obviously don't have the power to bring about all this change. I have a more power than a lot of people. Uh, and this is, a, as I said at the beginning, this book is part manifesto and this is my manifesto when yeah. I, I want to try to work with others. And, and it's a manifesto developed by on top of the work of many others, right? I didn't invent all those things in the, in the coda. They come from work that I know other people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, partly part of it, I, and this is just the way I get up every morning at a time when, you know, the reading the news is like putting a th 30 pound sack of rocks on your back, right? Or, and in your head, right? You have to constantly fight to think we're not going to come apart. We're not going to start right. shooting at each other. How can people be like this? Right. And I, so this is my act of faith, right? And I mm. do, I do believe, and I know from a lot of the research I've read, we are not as divided as the media makes it out. We really aren't, particularly in, in towns, you know, in places where people still do know each other, there is a, the possibility of, of coming together around a shared love of many things mm -hmm. about our country, not everything, but things, and I find this with Southerners. It's interesting because, yeah. you know, I'm a, yeah. I grew up in Virginia, you go to the North and everybody thinks you're practically on the plantation if you're white. And right. then you encounter other Southerners, many of whom are African American, and that you share a lot of stuff, even wow. as you, of course, have plenty of issues. Right. So that's it's it's an a, there is a lot of anger and there's a lot of despair, frankly. But this is, you know, it's that old thing about lighting a candle. This is my effort to try to to do what I can, but also to invite others to say, you know, yeah, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Yeah. You know, I, I played basketball in college and, and my coach used to always say, uh, you know, if, if, if I made a bad pass, we would always say my bad, my bad. Like we, we would try to say, you know, we'd be like, look, I'm correcting myself so you right. don't have to. And I had a coach named Sash Sullinger who was like, no, 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 no. If don't say my bad in this gym unless you're going to stop and explain to the entire gym why you made that mistake. Because Satch believed that if you did that, you were then holding yourself accountable. And so one of the things I think you're doing in this, which is which to me makes it one of the riskiest books I've ever read, is that you you are putting you and your leadership on the table. And you're saying, yeah. look at me, spin me around, look at me, hold me accountable for not just who I've been, but for the future that I want. And I do wonder what happens if we demand that of our leaders, of our boards of trustees, of our presidents of whatever. I, I mean, I'm, I'm still faithful and goofy enough to believe that some sort of change would happen. But then again, I do not think that our leaders have been educated enough to write a book like this, to do the work that it takes to look back with will and skill. So how did you, and it sounds like you're saying you sort of collected like memoir and, yeah. you know, uh, lots of different organizations over here, but how did you educate yourself into where this book renewal was a possibility? Because I think it is a product of, of, of not just privilege and power, but a particular kind of radical education that it seems like you might've had to go out on your own and find. Well, yeah. And I would say, again, that's, that's part of the from crisis to transformation, right? Yeah. If there hadn't been a crisis, I'd have sailed along, you know, thinking I was doing just fine, recognizing that, you know, there seemed there were there were some tensions here and you had to solve for that there. What happens is so there's a crisis, but what really gets me is I realize that I don't have the confidence of a lot of mm. the people I'm leading. Mm. And then I look back and think, you know, this has happened before, not the same way and in a very different context, but something's going on here and I need to figure it out. And that's where 
yeah, I mean, New America educated me. Many of the people who worked with me educated mm-hmm. me. Many I write about, you know, a young woman uh, who I work with, who I had mentored, but she she mentored me. I mean, I you know, she really she gave me stuff to read. She, but she also, I knew her well enough for her to say, you know, when you said that, this is what people heard. Mm-hmm. Right? This is mm-hmm. what it sounded like. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, I gave a talk at Barnard and I was full of, of confidence that I was doing the right thing. And then I read a lot and I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is like this is black feminism 101. You know, <laughs> like the, right. the white woman steps in right. and says, well, I'm going to give the speech. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really I really do think that that has to happen. It's not so bad because the, the, on the other hand, I've been, you know, I've read stuff and worked with people and seen things that are such a richer version of this country Mm. that that's what I'm telling people is, you know, Mm. you just have no idea what awaits us if we can make this change and not all of us are going to make it in generations you know, when the when the Woodrow Wilson School changed his name, which I I came to deeply support my father, who's 90 and who went graduated from it in 1953, he's not going to change his views. And OK, yeah. I get that. But there are a lot of us who can. And we've right. got a lot at stake. And I'm willing to hold myself to account. I know I will not get to all, you know, I, I you're never going to get all the way there. But if you try, you'll get further than if you don't don't set yourself up and 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 hold yourself accountable. Yeah, thank you for that, and and thank you for making a book um, that I that I know most of us have never read before. Uh, all right, let's try to get to these questions um, as many of them as possible. So the first one sounds sort of like something we might have gone over. Your book closes with an image of what 2026 might look like. Did you write that imagining it realistically or idealistically? Hmm. Uh, So I think a lot of the things I wrote about could happen. So I'll give you one example, and I hope to propose it to the Obama and Bush foundations. I say the Obama and Bush foundations come together and create a commission uh, to identify an equal number of new founders, right, from the original founders. And I got that idea because Barack Obama said in his eulogy for John Lewis, he said John Lewis was a founder. And I thought that is exactly right. He has, you know, we're in some ways we're constantly refounding the country, but certainly in 2026, there's this moment of of reflection, of commemoration, of lamentation. I mean, it's going to be a lot. We could absolutely identify the same number of founders as we had originally with a commission of conservatives and liberals. And there's some people who'd be obvious, right? And then there'd be others. So that's something we can certainly do. Are we gonna change e pluribus unum to pluris et unum in five years? Probably not, but we might get started. And could we have 15 states that have ranked choice voting? And so we'd be moving toward a genuine multi-party democracy? Yeah, we could do that because we've got two now and it's something that that can actually gain steam. So um, it's both. It, it's certainly it's idealistic, but it's each one of those things is being advocated by somebody and gaining support. And I want people to use 2026 as a kind of I got five years. I'm going to set a big goal, and even if you fall short, you got the next 25, right? Because we're really we're really working for 2050. Right. All right. I like. I love that. I like that a lot. Um, Second one is, if you could give one piece of advice to the next generation, I guess this is connected, on renewal and resilience, what would it be? So I'd give you two, but so one would be, be willing to, to, to give us a little grace, those of us who are older. And I cite a situation where you know, whether it's on gender pronouns or race or ethnicity, a lot of us are going to make mistakes. And Mm -hmm. I I quote Loretta J. Ross on calling in rather than calling out and just extending a little grace, right? We may not deserve it, but it'll be better if you give it. And so, and, you know, my sons and I joke about this all the time, but that would be one thing. But the other is don't compromise in what you're asking for. You know, (laughs) we really are at an existential moment in many ways. So be tolerant of of mistakes and failings, 
but don't give up the idea that really transformational change is both needed and possible. Yes, yes. Um, oh, okay, third question. What was the most surprising piece of feedback you've received on the book? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Well, all right. I'm going to be radically honest here. I, was about to <laughs> ask, I think I, I think I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, but this book went through three drafts uh, over a good bit of time, and the very first draft uh, I gave to Melody, uh, whom you you heard from, and she pointed out to me that my sources were incredibly white, mm. and you know, for particularly for this kind of book. Like, what am I doing? But even worse, when I read, you know, I read the New York Times op-ed page and I am constantly upset because so, particularly in foreign policy, male op-ed writers are citing men and they don't right. cite women. It drives right. me crazy. And I suddenly realize, oh my, you know, obviously if I were of color, I'd be looking to see who she reading. And I totally, I, you know, I, I really went back and started to look and thought, you know, what a, I can't write this book and make this mistake. And I, but I didn't expect it. You know, I really thought, you know, no, no, I, you know, I'm reading broadly. No, I wasn't reading broadly. Mm. And I think this is, this is connected to the fourth question, which is, I noticed you cited a lot of scholars in the book as you were writing, what works did you find most influential? And for those of you who haven't read the book, again, y'all, I, I just can't reiterate like, it, it. It's travel writing, memoir, sort of like literary analysis, uh, futurity studies, you know, it, it, you're doing a lot of different moves in here. But this is a great question. I noticed you cited a lot of scholars. What works did you find most influential? Whew, there's so many. So yeah. I will, I mean, I'm not flattering you. I thought heavy and no ashes in the fire and uh, Greg Pardlow's air traffic, which mm. I all read together. Those three, I mean, wow. they all take risks, yeah. big risks. I write about it. I say, you know, look, th this, <laughs> these are, are folks who didn't grow up in, with privilege and mm. who are really laying it out there. So those were, were very important. And I read those together. Um, I, so then, this is, this is gonna sound funny, but I'm not a historian, but mm -hmm. there's one chapter in there of history where I base it's called rugged interdependence. Right. And I say, you know, here's the history I grew up with Emerson self-reliance and, you know, the wagon train and the pioneer and the spirit of the frontier and rugged individualism. And I went back and did my best, like uh, really on uh, the wagon train stories, I read what women had written, mm. women's diaries of who had been, you know, with the guy up on the wagon. And they told stories that were completely different. They told stories of relying on their neighbors, you know, but for our neighbors, we never would have survived, but for the other folks in the wagon train. And it sounded like, you know, a communal experience. It was the antithesis of, you know, um, uh, of this rugged individualism. And then I read, um, oh God, I'm, I'm suddenly blanking on uh, the Underground Railroad. I'm blanking on Colson, it. The, Colson Whitehead. Right, Colson Whitehead. That was really profound. And there's a line in there that just, just is burned into my brain where he's talking about this enslaved woman, Cora, who finally makes it uh, right. to, to the North. And he says, she looked around and folks are singing a song they used to sing on the plantation and she doesn't understand how they could sing that. Well, how could they do that when they're working? And she says, she realized this was freedom, but it wasn't what she imagined. It was freedom as community, yeah. something lovely and rare. And I thought that is what the United States is missing. You know, all of our liberty, and I believe in liberty, but the idea that liberty, that freedom could be community, that was revelatory to me. Mm. I mean, that's the bedrock of the book. That's, that's the bedrock of, of your book, <laughs> it was right? I so mean... powerful. And that's a novel. Right, yeah, you know, right. It, it, it's so right. important. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna try to get these uh, next two in before we before we have to go. Um, there's been an erosion of public trust in higher education mm -hmm. in recent years. What is the path forward for these pillars of American democracy? 
Um, and just want to add this because so, so we can so we can just kind of go out with a bang. It is often hard to stay optimistic these days. The book is deeply op optimistic. What are you holding that is giving you faith today? So maybe you can talk about education and yeah. faith today. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> at, least, at least they didn't ask what I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> what are you on today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What are you taking? Um, so on the first one, this is a really important question. And we know that there's a tremendous decline in trust. And what you need to build trust is psychological safety and a sense of familiarity and some cross-cutting identity, right? So Kiese, you and I might say, well, you know, we both grew up in the South, right? We got a lot of differences, but we've got these things, or, you know, we both love the same sports team or, but the psychological safety piece is what's so critical. So you have these forums and stuff. Nobody says what they really think. You know, right. they're not saying what they really right. think. So this goes back to where I started. I think if you are willing to say, I was wrong here, this is what I thought, but I was wrong, or this is what I did and I was wrong. That's an opening that helps you move towards psychological safety and more trust. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just think it's because it immediately says, I'm making myself vulnerable to you, you right. know? And that means you got to trust something. Yeah. And I don't think we can address trust in the macro until we can find it back in our communities and our friends. So that's an education should be able to do that. I'm, I'm not sure it is, but it could. And the last thing is, again, you know, <laughs> I read the news and I am mm. scared. I'm genuinely scared. I, I think, you know, we are becoming a plurality nation. That is a huge transformation. And that kind of change in any country can cause huge upheaval. But I guess I do believe, I mean, this, this is the patriotic part. I believe this country has got stuff that can hold it together. And I genuinely believe that, that you know, Americans of every color, that, that, that diversity we have is such an asset. Mm -hmm. the, and if we can come to see that as an asset, that it connects us to the world, that we, you know, that we have, again, this tremendous reservoir of innovation and talent because culture and ideas are, are colliding, that that can be the container, as my friend Keith Yamashita says, that can be the container for a nation big enough to hold us all. And that, that gives my life more meaning as I think about fighting for that. Um, and that's the only way I know how to be. Otherwise I'd be a little, you know, puddle in the corner. I love that. I love that. Emery, thank you so much for um, daring to be wrong publicly, which is always like uh, daring to revise publicly. <laughs> um, I mean, we, 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 we should not have to thank each other for daring to revise, but we do. So thank you so much for daring to revise. And I want to thank all of you again. And this is just a reminder that you can purchase your copy of Renewal through our book selling partner, Solid State Books, by clicking on the button in the right-hand corner of the screen. Um, and you really need to get that book and you really need to talk about, talk with this book with folks you work with, folks you eat with, um, and folks you really purport to love. Thank you for giving us more important work to do. And thank y'all for spending an hour with us today. Thank you. Can't say thank you and thanks to the audience. That was just a fabulous conversation. Thank you.